This episode of Live WP TV is sponsored by the Microsoft Nerd Center in Cambridge and HostGator.com. So here we are, how to make your website a traffic magnet. And you were promised seven ways, but I actually have a little bit of a change of pace. There's way more than seven ways in this deck. There's probably a good 20 if you pay close attention. So let's get started. We've only got like what? 50 minutes, so we need to get cracking on this. So everybody's really trying to get leads. You know, whether you are in the nonprofit space, whether you're a consultant, whether you are a B2B or a B2C business, when I say leads, I mean people who come to your site with a purpose to engage with you. So even if you're not in B2B, B2C, maybe you're not selling anything, we are all basically in the business of trying to get leads to our site. If you're running a personal blog, you want people to read your blog, comment on it, share it, engage with your content, even those are leads. If you're running a nonprofit blog, you want people to donate, volunteer, and care about your cause, those are leads. And then there's the more conventional um, definition of leads, whether you are a large business and then you need a ton of leads all the time because only a small percentage of them convert, so you need to be in constant lead generation mode. Or if you're a small business, you need a good steady flow of customers, even if you're just an independent contractor, because you need to always have your next client lined up and your next client lined up. So even though we're all looking for different kinds of leads, we are all in the business of generating leads, so we all need a site that's a traffic magnet. So the number one rule of that is actually simple and has nothing to do with what we think of as traditional lead gen. You know, when people think of lead gen, they think of the tactics that actually face the customer at the end of the chain of lead gen, which is the PPC ad, the Facebook ad, the tweet, the person standing at a podium waving a flyer. That's the last thing that you should think of when you start thinking about making your website a traffic magnet. The first thing you need to think about is your website itself and is it designed for users because you can drive all the people to your site that you want and I've seen this happen with company after company. If your site isn't designed for conversions, you are going to lose all of those leads. And people will spend a ton of money on PPC, on social media advertising, and they'll wonder why they're still not getting any leads and you look at their site and it's like six screens of text nine points, that's why they're not getting any leads. So when you start thinking about making your site a traffic magnet, ask whether you've designed for your ideal customer in mind or whether you've designed for you in mind. And really think about this because most of the time when we start our own business or a group of us start a business or even in large corporate environments, people design to say what they want to get off their chest versus answer people's questions. And the lead gen conversation, the conversation by which a person randomly browsing the internet and Googling and clicking on a PPC ad or seeing a tweet or seeing a Facebook post and becoming a lead is a conversation where you answer somebody's question as to why they should engage with you. So start from your website and making it user friendly. Okay, but now what about the tactics? How do you actually start generating leads? My first principle that I tell everybody is A, B, test everything. Hands up everybody who's doing social media. Hands up everybody who's doing PPC ads. Blogging? Any other kind of advertising, display, banners, people waving flyers from podiums? Not too many. Um, hands up email marketing folks. Wow, everybody who didn't raise your hand, think long and hard about what you're doing. <laughs> Every single one of those things, the number one mistake I see people doing when they try to do lead generation is they throw a message out there, it goes back to slide one, and it says what they want to get off their chest or what they want to say about their product. And it doesn't say what necessarily is going to turn people into a lead. It doesn't answer their question. And you can have as many focus groups as you want. You can ask your cousin. You can stare at an ad for as long as you want. You will never know what's going to turn people into leads until you ask them themselves. And you can't ask them directly because people, like I said, in a focus group, are only going to say what they think you want to hear. Oh, yeah, that ad's pretty. 
And meanwhile, they would never buy from you. The only way you can tell whether you're actually sending people to your site who become leads is if you make sure that they're becoming leads. You measure everything. And you can test everything nowadays. So if you, regardless of what you're doing, whether you're doing email, social media, banner advertising, email marketing, promise me that you're going to test everything you do. It's really simple. If you're doing email marketing, A, B, test every single subject line. Because one thing we found, for instance, with my company is that we were facing internal um, debate and we were thinking that we really need clever subject lines in our email. Like, are you going to be late for lunch? Have you ever gotten one of those emails? They're actually kind of annoying, aren't they? The subject line we found tested best was event tomorrow at 6 p.m. That actually got like a 27% open rate. Are you going to be late for lunch? 8%. So before you think you need to be clever to generate leads or you need to say certain things like free, make sure you test what you've already got out there. Even if you've only got like two banner ads, you've tweeted four times in the past month and you've written two blog posts, you still have enough to test. Even if you only send out one email a month, you still have enough to test. So before you start doing any lead generation in the future, test what you're already doing. So if you're sending out emails with clever subject lines, test plain vanilla ones. If you're sending out plain vanilla subject lines, test the clever ones. If you're doing PPC advertising with a call to action that's very, very general, like find out more, test something specific like download white paper or save 20%. And find out whether your audience is going to become a lead with pro um, process A or process B. And no matter where you're at, you are going to find something you can test. Now, this is something that maybe it just worries me and some of my clients, but the, I always worry about the people who get the lousy control, the thing that's going to get the 8% conversion rate. What if they had gotten the good email, they'd be customers now, and I sent them the control, and now they're not going to become customers because we sent them the bad creative or the bad PC. Well, don't you lose leads when you test, people ask me? Well, you lose a lot more if you don't test. Sure, that one email, the people who got the 8% conversion rate subject line are lost this time around. But if you never test and you kept sending out clever subject lines or you kept paying for PPC ads that were vague in their calls to action, you'd be losing a lot more leads. So it's kind of like ripping the bandage off. You're going to have to put out two pieces of creative for every lead generation effort you make, often for weeks, maybe months on end. And yes, you're losing some traffic because some people are getting the control that's not going to test as well. But at the end of the day, your campaigns are going to be much more optimized. So don't worry about the lost leads. But you can also nowadays in the magical world of retargeting, chase down some of those lost leads. So first of all, when you're A-B testing anything or multivariate testing anything, set your certainty level to the lowest you're comfortable. You know, is everyone familiar with statistics and um, margin of error? Well, the more data you have, the more certain you are that your data is correct. So if you test something on 100 people and 80 of them like one thing and 20 of them like another, you're much more certain that that truly is the better piece of creative versus you test it on five people and three like one thing and two like the other. So decide what is the level at which you feel comfortable calling it a day and saying, okay, we've got our answer. Set it as low as possible. So if you would rather test creative on five people and you'll feel comfortable if three of them like this creative, go for it. Or 20 people or 10. It really also depends on what audience you're aiming for versus thinking I'm going to just test and test until with absolute mathematical certainty, I know this is the right answer because if you spend that much time testing, you are going to lose leads. And again, retarget and point back to the winner. So if somebody's come to your website and they didn't turn into a customer, you can always use retargeting using Google Ads or any other banner advertising that you're using where you can retarget people and go after the people who didn't convert with retargeting for 30 days or 60 days, get them back to your site, point them to the landing page or the creative that did test well, 
and then you have a chance that they're going to become customers again. So does that make sense to everybody? Like, just go ahead and retarget all of your lost leads and test and iterate fast. Make it a priority. A lot of people just want to get stuff out there and they're not testing fast enough. So speaking of retargeting, who has in the past month been followed around the internet by something you looked at? Who has been creeped out by it? So half, half the people were followed around. I would say the general public, do you think they get creeped out a little bit more than... Yeah. It's creepy, isn't it? It's awful, isn't it? Conversion rates are 50 to 60% higher for retargeted ads. That means that even though everybody is completely creeped out by it, according to CMO.com, recent research says that the CTR actually for display ads in general is now down to 0.07%. The CTR for retargeted ads is 0.7%, which is still an order of magnitude greater. And even people who don't like retargeting, which is the general public, as we believe as marketers, people are 50 to 60 percent higher in their likelihood to convert if they've been retargeted. That means, yes? Have you seen any research about uh, the B&B space separate from the whole world together? You know, anecdotally I have, and I would say that it's even higher in the B2B space because your average B2B buyer is a little bit more sophisticated of, about retargeting and more tolerant of it. I think we get more creeped out by being followed around by a bar of soap than by CRM software. You know, it just feels less intrusive. So anecdotally I'm seeing retargeting, and even in the education space, retargeted ads are converting very highly. So I, I think that even though we feel that it's making people uncomfortable, people are still clicking and they're, they're still converting. And after about 15 years in the digital marketing space, I can tell you that what works one year, people will start to become immune to the next year. So there was a time, for those of you who are still in college, this may seem utterly incredible, when people clicked on banner ads. <laughs> I know! Isn't that incredible? People clicked on banner ads. Why? Because they had never seen one before. Some of them clicked on it by accident because they didn't know what they were clicking on. Others clicked on it because it was genuinely useful content that they hadn't learned to be blind to. My experience has been for every digital channel that we start to see great conversion rates for, and it's working fantastic, after four years it will be completely dead or completely changed. I don't think that Twitter's going to be completely dead in four years. I honestly don't think that Facebook's going to be completely dead in four years, but the way people engage with it is going to change. So if retargeting is working now, and people are clicking on retargeted ads, run retargeted ads. And the data is telling you that people are clicking on retargeted ads. So go for it. So who here obsessively stares at your Google Analytics? Please. Well, Melanie, I'm glad you are. So if you're putting lead information, lead generation, out there of any kind, information for your leads to click on to make them convert, and you're not looking at your Google Analytics within 24 hours of anything hitting, and then again in another day, and then again in another day until the campaign is done, you are wasting your money. Because the only way you know if something is working for lead generation, whether it's PPC, whether it's a banner ad, I don't know if anyone's having any luck with those, whether it's social media, is if you're looking at Google Analytics, and if you're looking at specific data in Google Analytics, such as conversions by source. So in other words, if you're not looking at whether you're getting more leads from Twitter than Facebook, then potentially the money you're spending on Twitter or Facebook is going to waste. Similarly, you also want to look at the dollar value of each source of traffic and leads. So in other words, if you're spending equal amounts of money, and I've had this happen to me a bunch of times, throw equal amounts of money on three social media channels, so let's say Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Let it run for a month. And then go back and you'll see, okay, well we got 100 leads off of LinkedIn, we got 300 leads off of Twitter, we got 500 leads off of Facebook. Facebook's the winner, right? Yeah, but what if the dollar value of every single Facebook lead that you got was literally only a dollar? Like, they're literally, when you look at how much they spent, their value was very small. Maybe their average purchase was $10. 
versus the leads you got off of LinkedIn spent an average of $100 to $150. Well then, LinkedIn, even though it's aggregate volume of leads that it's generated for you, is much smaller, maybe a fifth of Facebook, it could potentially be generating a ton more of your revenue. So always look at the dollar value of each referral. And it's usually fairly straightforward, we'll talk a little bit more about how to do that. But if you're not looking at this regularly, you are pretty much, you may as well just take your cash and throw it out the window. Because you don't know where your advertising dollar, or your email, or your organic efforts at generating leads, like Twitter, that you just organically do, or Facebook, are getting leads for you. So always check your Google Analytics within a day of something going out, within two days of something going out, and daily. Honestly, make it a discipline. Look at your Google Analytics daily whenever you have campaigns running. You will also see really interesting variations based on time of day and day of the week. And if you're wasting your money on a particular channel, you'll be able to stop that bleed fast if you're constantly checking your analytics. And if you have a channel that's wildly successful, you'll be able to put more effort into that while those leads are still hot. And look at your data honestly. I think that if you're the person who designed the creative for a campaign or came up with the idea for the campaign, you shouldn't be the sole person evaluating it unless you're a sole proprietor. Even then, try to get a friend who's also a sole proprietor or hire an intern or somebody to look at that data because numbers don't lie, but we're very good at lying to ourselves. And I know from personal experience, I've seen people and even done it myself, you write an ad, you think it's marvelous, it's fantastic, you're madly in love with it, and like four people clicked on it. And you just were so proud of that ad because it was so cleverly designed, and it has references to your favorite movie, and you just can't let it go because you are too close to the creative that went out. So if you're doing a lead generation campaign, always get a second pair of eyes to look at your Google Analytics because it's the only way to ensure, basically, data integrity. Also, take a look at conversion paths that people are engaging in in your Google Analytics. So has everyone looked at the conversion paths in your analytics? How about the traffic flows through your site? Have you looked at that? Isn't it awesome? Yeah, it's pretty cool, as the gentleman in the corner said. You can look at not only where people land on your site in Google Analytics, but you can look at how they then flow through the site. So let's say people come to your home page, they tend to drop off after three pages. People come to one of your landing pages that talks about the value of your product, and they will then go look at six pages, including four specific product pages. You'll be able to tell that and trace it back to the lead gen effort, whether it was email, whether it was Twitter, whether it was an ad. Yes, sir. not going to have that tight in integration and you're not going to have as good data. So um, I really think if you're doing PPC and we're talking about lead gen, you've got to be looking at your Google Analytics. So the other question that people come to me with when they're doing lead gen especially, whether they're clients or whether they're people asking for information is, we just want to generate a bunch of leads and have people buy from us. We don't want to waste our time doing content. You're not going to get it. Seriously, you're not going to get any leads. When was the last time you trusted an advertisement? Have you ever trusted, raise your hand, has anyone trusted an ad? Have you ever driven down the highway and seen a billboard and said, yes, that billboard, that is an honest billboard, I will do what it tells me to do? No, no, you've never done that. It raises awareness. I mean, I'm not saying that don't do billboards and don't wave flyers from podiums, because it certainly wave generates awareness, but you notice that even on the flyer, I've got content. You have to explain yourself to people. We don't live in a world where people do business because you have a clever ad or a great, you know, flyer on the side of the road. 
When I say you have to do content, I mean you have to have blogs, you have to have in-depth product descriptions on your website, you have to do video or webinars, you don't have to do it all. But you have to have information on your site that proves three things. One, that you're trustworthy. Two, that you know what you're talking about. And three, that you care. If there is no content on your website, you don't put any information there, you're not blogging. Let's say you're in the business of making handbags. That might be an area where you think to yourself, well, I, I don't need to blog about handbags. I, I just need to put them out there. They look good, and people will buy from me. Well, guess what? It's already a saturated market. So how are you going to get into that saturated market? Well, you could write tips on the latest fall handbags and how to integrate them with the things you already own. That's going to be a lot more trustworthy from you as a small vendor that nobody's ever heard of, and it's going to show that you care. And one of the number one reasons that people do business with small or upcoming or never heard of before vendors is because they think they're going to get better customer service. So showing you care, showing you're thoughtful, showing that you're in depth about your content area. How much? Oh, okay. Is one of the I thought you were giving me the five minutes thing. I was like, what? Those are the ways in which you can stand out from the crowd. And even, that's even the case of, say, B2C in some of the consumer product. But let's say you are a nonprofit, like somebody I just spoke to this evening in the networking um, part of the session. Well, think about that. There's only a limited amount of dollars, both grant money or <coughs> donations. There's a limited number of volunteer hours out there that people are willing to give up their time. The way you're going to engage those people to support your nonprofit, to give their time, to spread your message, to potentially donate or grant, give you a grant, is by showing what you're doing with the money and time that you're given, how important your cause is, and the impact that you're making. Simply saying that we have a cause is not enough nowadays because everybody has a cause. And if you're in B2B tech, you simply cannot survive without content. Whether it's a webinar, whether it's a white paper, whether it's even just a simple blog. If you are selling technology that costs a lot of money, or even a moderate amount of money, and you are not talking in depth about your industry, showing your expertise, showing your knowledge, people are first of all not even going to become leads. They're not interested in hearing how great your product is, how cheap your product is, how it has 0% downtime. They want to get educated about whatever it is that they do, that you're in the same space as, whether it's um, telephony software or uptime monitors. They want to get good content from you that makes them more effective at their jobs, and that's the only thing that they're going to be willing to click on. Not your specs, not the fact that you exist. Nobody cares that you, you and your company exist. They don't. They care what you're going to do for them and content is the way to deliver that. So when you want to make your website a lead magnet, you want to put great content on it, and then you want to let the world know via PPC, social media, and waving flyers that it's there. That is the only really good way to generate leads. So yes, you need good content. So now you've got great content. You've got your white papers, you've got your webinars, you've got whatever it is that you've put out there for content. We saw a lot of people do a show of hands that you're doing PPC. It is one of the number one ways that people are generating leads in both B2B and B2C. Um, so what are some quick ways you can make your PPC, that is your Google AdWords and other forms of um, paid per click advertising, more effective? Well, test after test after test has shown that just like with email marketing, being factual helps. Don't be clever. Sometimes it works to be clever, but nine times out of ten, people want to know that you have handbags for 20% off, or that you are selling red rain boots, or that you are selling um, telephony software that's open source and, inter and connects with Microsoft products. They want to know exactly what it is you have to sell, and then if you have content out there, they want to know exactly what your content is. Read the white paper on using open source telephony software. Watch the webinar on the importance of uptime monitoring. Just stay factual. Event tomorrow at 6 p.m. 
is a high conversion subject line and a high conversion so, um, PPC um, tagline because it tells people exactly what they're going to get if they're going to click. The internet is so full of noise that people are not interested in clever anymore unless it's incredibly clever, which is really, really rare. They want to know what they're getting before they click because their time is precious. Um, again, connected to content. I've seen so many lead generation programs fail that connect to a sales pitch. How many times have you willingly subjected yourself to a sales pitch? Who in the last 30 days has subjected themselves willingly to saw a salesperson calling you? Okay, Alice, you, you, you did. What was the occasion? What, what made you, you sir, why, why were you willing to be pitched to? What made him a good salesman? <laughs> what did he say? <laughs> um, he, I've been following his, uh, his email newsletter for a while. And there you go. Yeah. He had good content, and you wanted more of it, right? So you subjected yourself to a sales pitch, but you wanted his content. It wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bad. That was the other thing, too. It wasn't that bad. You got content, and you were willing to sit through the sales pitch. So, Alice, how about you? What happened to you? Uh, I was just some kid in the neighborhood, and I lost the way he thought he was under eight, and I Well, <laughs> that's different. I wish we could all hire <laughs> cute little Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, I and mean, you know, buy my enterprise. He was smart. So exactly. But, but, you know, but um, I learned a lot. But, uh, but I sat through it. Otherwise, you wouldn't have. Well, cute kids, you know, it, there's child labor laws in general, so that's a hard strategy. Yeah, you know. <laughs> exactly. But the one person who did subject himself, this gentleman up at the front to a sales pitch, they wanted content. The worst, the number one mistake people make in, ma in turning their website into a lead magnet is putting out a PPC ad or an email campaign saying, fill out this form and someone will contact you to learn your needs. We live in dread of somebody contacting us to learn our needs. <laughs> Whenever someone contacts me to learn my needs, I hang up. Politely, but I do. I mean, don't ever ask people to give you their contact information so that you can learn their needs. You should know their needs in their minds before you ever get into any kind of conversation with them. That's where the content comes in. That guy had information that met your needs. So he didn't need to talk to you to learn your needs. He was already pushing the content out to you that met your needs. So don't do a lead gen campaign where you just push the leads to sales and have them call. Those are not going to convert. Most people are not even going to fill out that form. Very few people are desperate enough for your specific product that they're going to fill out and have sales contact you form. And generally, they've already been exposed to a lot of content when they do that. And again, be very specific. Has anybody um, experimented with keyword additions in their PPC? I don't see any hands coming. Oh, you. How did it work for you? When you say keyword additions, you're talking about after you start it, continue to add as the campaign goes on? Oh, no. Um, I'm talking about the feature in um, Google AdWords where you can set a parameter. You, you, have to, you still have to code it yourself. But you can set a parameter where it will insert the keyword somebody searched for into your ad automatically. Dynamic. Dynamic, yeah, dynamic keyword edition. Yeah. It's really, really effective. We've been playing around with it with one of my clients. Basically, the way it works is if somebody searches for um, sugar-free chocolate, and you just have ads out there saying that you have chocolate for sale at 20% off, it will insert the words sugar-free into the ad so that it looks like it's exactly what they were searching for. You, you have to do a lot of thinking to get this up and running, and it's a little bit more work than just throwing a PPC ad out there. But let's say you have a shop that sells handbags, and you just have handbags 20% off as your ad content. If someone searches for red sports sack handbag, it's going to insert those exact words into your ad without you having to do anything. It works incredibly well. It's very cool. It looks like you've read your customers' minds and anticipated their every need. Yes, sir. 
sounds like you're inserting things into the ad you might not be, you might not have. I mean, you can ad is easy enough, but yeah. you know, make sure to free chocolate. How do you know what to add and what to promise and what not to promise? You could set negative keywords. You set negative keywords, like the gentleman said. You can say, this is we don't offer this. So if you um, only sell vegan shoes, you would have a negative keyword uh, for leather. And you wouldn't promise people what... And you can also test and see what, what's getting inserted. And if you don't like it, you've come up with more negative keywords. And that's why you have to test and look at your analytics and your results all the time. Because if it's inserting keywords that don't um, make sense for you, you can just set them as negative keywords and stop with all of those ads that are irrelevant. Um, search retargeting, that's retargeting people not based on the fact that they have gone to your site, but on what they have searched for. Um, it's relatively new, but you can now target people with advertising that then follows them around based on what they've searched for. Um, another really quick tip again for optimizing your PPC that a lot of people are not doing, these are the top three that I'm seeing people not do that they should be doing, paying close attention to mobile conversions versus desktop and what ad content converts on mobile versus desktop. The days when you could put a one-size-fits-all ad campaign out there and assume that whatever differences shake out between mobile and desktop, you'll just live with it, are long gone. You need completely different keywords sometimes on mobile versus desktop, different ad copy, different calls to action. And you want to pay very close attention to that. So let's say you have some retail outlets or you're a school that only wants to reach people in the Boston area. You're going to get, in, my, in the case of one of my clients, much higher conversions based on mobile because of the target audience that they're aiming for are people under 25, and they're much more likely to convert online, especially for a school for some reason. So pay very close attention to what, what you're putting out for mobile versus desktop, and if you have to come up with two different ad campaigns for one or the other, do it. So if this gentleman is selling a webinar, you're not going to watch that on your phone. Maybe you are, maybe you're, you know, a glutton for punishment, but in general, you're going to want to promote something that's long-form B2B content that people have to consume slowly and thoughtfully. You're going to want to promote that kind of thing on desktop, and mobile is going to be more of a conversion, maybe reading five tips on something, or seeing a quick infographic that they can then share from their phone, on social media with their followers, something that's more attuned to mobile. But definitely make sure you're separating your mobile to and your desktop leads because otherwise you're wasting your money on PPC. Alright, so now the leads are on your page. You have convert you've optimized your both your mobile and your PPC and your um, desktop PPC. You've got your keyword insertions, you've been looking at your analytics at what subject lines are converting fastest. And you've gotten a good bunch of leads to your site. But this is about making your website a traffic magnet. So is the game over when they come to your website? No. no. Have you ever felt bad about how many of the leads you generated didn't convert? Feel better today. 96% of site visitors, according to Forrester Research, um, in a report published in Search Engine Land, never convert to a lead or a sale. 96% of the traffic that comes to your site will never, ever even contact you, let alone become a sale. So you got to throw a lot of traffic at your site, right, in order to get a decent amount of leads. But there's also a lot you can do to increase that percentage. And even if you get it down to 93%, you're still doing a lot better than most. Who here has landing pages on your site specifically tied to PPC ads, to social media campaigns, to stuff you post on Facebook. Everybody else is really leaving money on the table unless you have a very, very narrowly focused, maybe, consulting business. Landing pages are not optional because there's nothing on your static website generally that can double as a landing page. There really isn't. So build landing pages already. Who here is sending people from your PPC campaigns or your email campaigns to your home page? Well, in, in that case, if you're a consultant, don't feel sheepish. It might work. So where else are you sending people from your campaigns to on your site? 
The checkout even? page. Pardon? The checkout page. The checkout page? So you're sending people to the... Oh, or buy me. To, to a buy me page. To a, to a product page. That can work if you're doing e-commerce. But even then, a thoughtfully designed landing page that showcases a variety of different products, if you sell a variety of different products, will increase your sales per lead generated. So in other words, if you are advertising a specific shoe or car part, if you send people to a landing page that shows two or three related items, you're much more likely to be able to upsell them. So one thing, don't ever send people to the home page, but create landing pages that are custom tailored to the message you use to generate the lead in the first place. So if your ad says, shoes 20% off, make sure you send people to a page that says shoes 20% off, because there's a huge difference between web pages and landing pages. Web pages are meant to inform people, create trust, like I said before, and serve as a content repository where all of your great content, in aggregate, your blog, your white papers, are living. Landing pages, on the other hand, are designed to quickly attract people, make them give up their contact information, create enough trust to just get that contact information and engage them in a conversion opportunity, create excitement, and they can also more or less serve as short-term content, maybe related to a specific sale that you're offering or to a webinar that you're offering. It's really the difference between dressing for a job or interview versus going out clubbing. Your landing pages are your business going out clubbing. It has to be flashy, it has to be energetic, and it has to quickly send a message. Yes, sir. I think we're raising your hand. It should be on your main website, but it shouldn't be your home page. Okay, but your, 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 your headline, your reading and all that is still okay either. Just... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you can have it be part of your, you know, have your main navigation be visible, or it could be a separate dedicated landing page. It's, there's really no right or wrong answer. It honestly depends on your business. If you're in B2B tech, you want people to be able to access the rest of your website from that landing page. So even if you're saying sign up for my webinar or um, download our white paper, your landing page should focus completely on the webinar or the white paper. You shouldn't send people to your home page and have a little widget talking about your webinar down over here because they're just not going to convert. You want to talk all webinar all the time. But again, remember, you're trying to create trust. So you want the rest of your site to be accessible so that they see you're a real company and not just some random spam. That said, I have seen for well-known brands, okay, um, landing pages that just trade on the brand name and maybe have like a logo where you can get back to the home page but don't have the navigation on it. It really depends on how much trust you've already built up with your audience. But definitely, definitely make sure that you are creating landing pages when you're putting the gen campaigns out there. And then make sure that your CNS is working to capture those leads. So I have cleaned up Salesforce implementations in my career where the company had maybe four or five calls to action. One was that we're interoperable. One is that we're cheaper. One is that we are, um, you know, we have 99.9% .9 uptime. And one, that, one is that we are the company that's been around the longest. However, every single lead came in through one single form that was replicated on every single landing page, exactly the same, same code, so they all fed into Salesforce, simply labeled lead. There was no information as to what call to action had gotten people to the site and what their pain point was, and so we had sales emailing people saying, I'm so glad you're interested in our affordable, cost-effective software. And they had filled out a form on a landing page that said that ours is the highest quality. And they were like, well, I don't know. I'm not looking for cheap stuff. I thought you said you were high quality. There was such a disconnect between the message they saw on the website and what sales was saying to them because the leads were set up in such a way in Salesforce that we weren't telling sales why that person had contacted us. So get it at least good enough at Salesforce that you're coding each lead form on each landing page correctly so that you know what led people from the PPC ad or the social media content all the way through your landing page and potentially your site 
down to contacting sales so that they, when they pick up the phone or email the person who has to be contacted, are picking up that conversation that that lead has already had with your brand since the moment that message to book them. So here's a little checklist of what you need at a minimum for running out of time. But make sure you tag, and these slides are going to be available by campaign or lead source or industry um, language and pain points so that you know why people contacted you. And again, make sure you pay attention even in B2B uh, for mobile. So you're going to want simpler forms when people get a mobile site. You, want, you don't want them to fill out 16 different drop-down menus on their tiny little screen. Make sure you're also optimizing your forms for mobile. And make sure, test it out on a multitude of different devices. Make sure that those forms are working, your message is resonating, and your landing page looks okay. Because you can have the most beautiful landing page on the face of the earth, but if 30% of your traffic is mobile, and you have to scroll side to side to fill out that form, on the mobile version of your site, you've just lost those 30% of your leads. So be very, very careful with that. So wait, there's more. We're not going to talk about it now. But think about, here's a couple of things that you should think about when you're doing a lead generation campaign for your site, whether you're in B2B or B2C. Can everybody hear me okay if I still wait for the mic? Okay. Um, make sure your forms are good, your calls to actions are good, and make sure that your offer makes sense for the ad that you put out there. So if you're saying that we are the cheapest, then maybe it's a webinar on how to save money, not a webinar on how to work with interoperable open source software. Because if you've got a disconnect between your ad and your landing page and your call to action, people are again going to drop off and get lost. So make sure every piece of that funnel is tight. It's not enough to just have good tweets. Not enough to just have good ads. It all has to integrate nicely. So test, test, test. Again, do not worry about the control. Those people will come back to you if they really wanted to be your customers. Yes. You need content, and remember that 80% of the battle to get people to become your customer is on your website. Yes, you need to drive them there, but your website needs to make them stay. And yes, you need to go mobile right now. So I really hope that this is giving you way more than seven pointers on how to make get leads from your website, get them there, and get them converted. Um, my name is Christina Inge. Here's some of my contact information. Um, my website sleepmarketinguniversity.com. We're doing a day-long boot camp on digital marketing, October 10th. Um, if you're interested in Blog Camp Boston, you have the contact information there too. But if you've got general questions on lead gen or digital marketing, that's my Twitter. That's my email. Uh, do I have time for like a question or two? Yep. All right, I've got time for a question or two. Really? I've answered all of your questions? Okay. Uh, what have you found has been the most effective avenue? Like Google, social, Facebook, LinkedIn, like Twitter? It's just like asking what's the best food. <laughs> for what? Um, I, for, are you in B2B or B2C? B2C. What are you selling? Consulting. Consulting. To consumers? Yeah. About what? It's for, well, I'm doing it for so it's uh, for like career types. Career consulting. Yeah. LinkedIn would be a good channel for you. It really is a, your industry, and that's why I said test, test, test. I mean, you can try. I found LinkedIn works great for schools, which is a comparable thing. You have know, people improving their career prospects. I, Facebook, maybe. Um, do you have an email list? Yeah. How many? Uh, 14,000. Okay, so test, segment that. 14,000 people are very unlikely um, to be identical. So segmenting that list, you could probably get a lot of value out of it. it really, it's going to be what leads to conversions for you, but email is very effective. Um, I would be concerned about PPC because it's really a broad audience that you're in, but it might work for you to do some Google AdWords. Uh, it's whatever, whatever works for you. Anybody else? Oh, sir. Uh, do you use any software like Yesware for email? I've used Yesware, yeah. Um, I'm also a big fan of having, even if you just do business like on a really small level, having some kind of CRM. 
even if it's just like in optimized insightly or something, um, I find that that's really effective. We don't all need Salesforce, but we need something between just plain old MailChimp. Although MailChimp's getting more and more um, powerful with its marketing automation, but some kind of CRM or ESPR is, is really effective. Yes, oh. Earlier you talked enthusiastically about how Peter, people want to be educated. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on educational seminars or even a solution like LearnDash that turns your site into an online classroom? They can be really good. They can be really good. I found that edu marketing, you know, we hear about edutainment. Edu marketing is getting more and more popular because people, the hunger for learning, they say that online learning is going to become a $50 billion industry in a few years, in like by 2020. A lot of that's going to be commercially motivated. I feel strongly about that. So it's, again, it's whatever tests well for you, but give it a try. Yes? Now we're at a WordPress meetup here, but WordPress, have you ever used this or compared it to something like um, lead pages or unbounds? They're, they're actually pretty good. Again, they are at a WordPress meetup, but I've used unbounds to great effect. Um, it goes back to this gentleman's question of do you want your landing pages to be on your main domain? I would say ideally yes, because it gives you one less thing to manage and analyze, but if you need to spin stuff up fast and you don't have a graphic designer, there's nothing wrong with Unbounce. It's actually quite effective. But there's also some really good lead plugins. Just search for lead plugins, um, and those can really make your own site flow in Unbounce. One more question, and um, one more question. You again, okay. <laughs> You're you using me. No. Okay. So um, I can't speak to it specifically, but um, there's just a variety of tools out there. It's what you have a comfort level with. I, it doesn't matter if some other tool is more popular. Use what you're going to use regularly because lead generation is about regularity. So make sure you're using the tool that you like, even if everyone else swears by something else. All right, so I guess with that, um, I am ready to hand off to the next speaker. Thank you, everybody. And if you have a question, I'm going to stay around.